Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to more Tsukihime. Let's carry on. Alright guys, so last time I chose go back to school, I thought that was the right answer and it led me to a bad end. So apparently it's between her apartment or the back alleys of the shopping district. Uh, I really don't think it's her apartment. I really don't, but you know what? Uh, at this point, if I get another bad end, it's okay because then we know what the actual choice is. So we're going to check out the back alleys of the shopping district. I'll head for the shopping district. I've got nothing to base it on, but I have a feeling that Arkway would prefer the darkness of the inner city. She looks so sad and wounded before. Something tells me she'll seek out a place where she won't run into anyone. A place where nobody ever comes by. If you want to run away from everything, you're not going to look for familiarity until after the matter is settled. This won't be your place. But I don't think my instincts will be enough to find her. There's only one way for me to add a measure of accuracy to my wild hunch. I remove my glasses. Death drowns my vision. Lines pulse across human buildings and the rest of the city. I swallow back the bile that rises up to my throat. Our creator doesn't possess the same abundance of death that other life forms do. In a world overflowing with death, she's the only respite from their repulsive lines. If I look out across the crowds, she should stand out as a singular unblemished beacon. It's not the most refined plan, but it's the best I have right now. Pain bursts behind my eyes. I do my best to view everything in that detached, general way, without focusing on any one line too much. Arcway told me this pain is caused by the burn that seeing death puts on the brain. My glasses can't stay off for too long. Everyone downtown has perfectly ordinary lines. There's not a single soul around that looks like the ones we hunted down before, with masses of graffiti crisscrossing their bodies. <laughs> So at this point, I'm going to get another bad end, huh? <laughs> you know what? Fine. Uh, that just adds on to all the other options. I rub my temples to soothe the throbbing beneath the skin. My headache will only intensify if I keep my glasses off. But I have to hold out a little longer, on the off chance she's somewhere on the main streets. It's fine. It'll be easier from here on out. Once I get to the alleys, there'll be fewer people and way fewer lines. I need to hurry for those darkened back streets. In a place where even the moonlight can't reach, it should be easy to spot her bright pale form. <sighs> the exhaustion of running combined with my throbbing headache makes me want to hurl. When I wipe the sweat from my forehead, I notice how feverish I am. I can feel my temperature even with my own hand. I don't remember ever feeling this hot, not even when I had a near 40 degree fever. It's the only place I haven't checked yet. At the end of this road lies the alley where we had our first conversation. If she's not here, I'll have to admit my gut is off. <laughs> A wave of cold hits me the moment I step into the alley. The chill that crawls down my spine is icy enough to cool my fever. I see something strange in the distance. Sparks popping and crackling within the darkness. Or, to be more precise, lines of death. Thick clouds of them thrumming and churning before they vanish into nothingness. <laughs> the intermingled lines of death belong to zombies. The fact that they're disappearing can only mean one thing. <laughs> Against my better judgment, I press on through the pain and exhaustion, all but forgetting the foreboding chill that hangs thick in the air. Pushing against the rusted iron door, I slip into the dark passage. I'm in the alley entrance. The buildings press in on both sides. 
I wade through the lines as if traversing a muddled river. Muddy river. At least a hundred lines were cut here tonight. But that doesn't make sense. I know this place. Dead or alive, there's no space for a hundred zombies to fit here. That means the grizzly scene before me can only be. A single bite dismembered into dozens of little pieces. Oh, okay, once again. Picked the wrong choice, apparently. It looks it. It doesn't matter. I refuse to think about it. But what I can't bear is that with every step I take, the creaking and gnawing of bone rattles my ears. <gasps> Instinct strokes my brain stem with saw-like teeth whispering. Stop. Don't go. Turn back. That which awaits you at the end is not for your eyes to behold, it says. I know that already. But I won't go back. I won't abandon Arquade. If I leave her now, I've got an awful haunting feeling that she'll die. It's a premonition I can't shake, so despite my better judgment, I press further in. I'm here. There's no trace of zombie flesh. My mind runs cold. My vision is consumed. An ocean of red liquid waste covers my every covers every surface. The remnants of zombies, now faceless arms, crushed to pulp, insides completely mangled, violated totally and needlessly. The thick stench of blood mingles with the cold still air, robbing me of my voice. Everything is red. The walls, the ground, perhaps even the moon's glow have taken on a crimson hue. Oh, so she is here. Good to know. A dull squelching noise echoes to the alley. A creature, maybe the last of many, covered in thick, heavy lines, dies at her hands. She crushes it without effort or mercy, with a single hand, like an ant. The zombie's head is grabbed by unseen hands and lifted into the air, where it dangles for a moment before an enormous pressure caves it inward, splattering the walls with blood and brains. I gaze upon this world where even the moonlight is crimson. At its center stands Arkwade. She hasn't noticed me. She's just staring at the moon, entranced, her breathing heavy and wild. can't call for her. The creaking sensation in my spine reaches its climax. It's as if the saw finally cut through the bone. My consciousness is screaming. I can't stay here. I don't want to die. It wails. But it's too late. If this world of red and white, I am an intruder. The woman in white turns. Like a one-eyed demon, she shifts her terrible glare my way. That golden eye is blinding. See, if I saw that in real life, I'd be a goner. That's terrifying. But I looked into her, into hers all the same. That alone was enough to make the blood rush into my head. Enough to erase all reason, all sense of self. The first thing I feel is pure survival instinct. You can't be here. You can't look at that. Don't make your presence known. Don't let them see you. You can't talk to them. You can't coexist. It's impossible. You can't fight it. You can't escape. You can't even pray. No matter what you do, you can no longer be saved. This creature is on a different level. Though the concept of levels is meaningless here, the difference between us is so vast, we may as well be on different planes of existence. It is more than me, it eclipses my being. Which is why every one of my blood vessels dilates at once. It starts with fear. A bloodlust, akin to rapture, follows soon after. Like lightning flashing across a clear sky, it clears conclusion in the history of mankind. My cells rejoice at revelation on par with that of the most enlightened saints. It's simple. This thing shouldn't be allowed to exist. We have no need for it. 
so we must kill it. Kill it quickly. Kill it here. Kill it now. Be swept away by the pulsing river in your veins and expel that thing. My heart leaps. I know I couldn't win, yet every part of me rumbles and moans, urging me to kill her. This is all backwards. If I don't want to die, I should kill? Even though I'll be killed, I should kill? Is my head crammed with nothing but thoughts of murder? <laughs> I guess you're both turning each other into monsters, huh? It's no use. My ego's gone. That eye. I shouldn't look into that golden eye. There's nothing I can do. There's no way to escape her. My blood declares boiling with every beat. It surges in a way I can hardly resist. But there's something else. Something desperate to crush the desic desiccated husk of my rationality. Why do I want to kill? Is it because I don't want to die? So I need to kill before I'm killed? What a stupid thought. I'm gonna die laughing at this rate. You don't need a reason. Be honest with yourself, Shiki Tono. Don't you remember what you did to that woman once upon a time? No, you. Your rationality is what needs to shut up. It's really that simple, isn't it? I want her. I want Ark Wade. I've craved her from the moment I saw her. So badly it made me want to puke. <laughs> what an odd thing to say. You want someone so bad it makes you want to throw up. I want all of her. Her body and mind. Her tears. And her saliva. Her blood. Her flesh. Her desire. Her frustration. My breathing is abnormal. I'm losing consciousness. The golden pupil flickers. Looking at her, I think that no matter how much I kill her, it'll never be enough. Her eyes are red again, but it's already too late. We're past the point of no return. A stifled cry enters my ears, like I care. I grip my knife tighter and push the woman to the ground. It's easy. All strength has left her body. Straddling her, I wrap one hand around her throat. I raise the other high in the air, knife poised. There's just one thing left. Striking a single blow into the space between her breasts. I hear the woman's voice. The pulsing beat in my head boils. Shut up. My fingers tighten their grip around their neck. She throws her head back in pain. I struggle to believe it. She's normally brimming with strength that she can't even rid herself of my grip. Still struggling for air, she gasps my name. My heart pounds, impelled by my excitement in my blood. Each breath is wilder than the last. My vision is distorted. Every part of me feels like it's turned to lava. It's hot. So hot. I want release. My body moves. Slowly. Purposefully. I remove myself from her stomach. Sliding downward. Spreading her legs, I sink my hips into the space between. Yo, my guy, what are you doing? <laughs> Her eyes shimmer with anxiety. The gaze only makes my brain boil at a higher pitch. <sighs> my vision is bloodshot. I feel like I might faint. Every cell in my body cheers with elation. This is what we were born for. If I don't, this woman right now, I'll go insane. Her vermilion-tinged cheeks. Her neck so very soft. Nothing could surpass the form of the woman beneath me. I can feel her every motion. Her 
her eyes, brilliant pools of gold that seem to suck in my soul. My arm leaves her neck. Its fingers trace her chest. They feel the softness of her body, of her legs. When my fingertips meet the pale skin of her abdomen, I notice the warmth that lies beneath her flesh. I'm honestly more surprised she was able to come into control of herself faster than Shiki. Her voice trembles with heat. Her red eyes plead to me. With that, the last of my thoughts become unhinged. There's a soft gasp, a cry, as if to stifle her shame. With both hands, she desperately tries to push me off. But I grab her wrist, pinning them to the ground so they can't move. If only I had nails to hammer them down with. With her hands like this, she looks like she belongs in a crucifix. Her eyes are filled with contempt, regret towards the man holding her down. The sigh is intoxicating. She's even more alluring than she was before. I can't use both my arms. The second I let go, she'd no doubt sever my neck. The tension elicits a grin from me. I must be more beast than man. My urge to violate her is surpassed by my desire to see us kill each other. Once more, my hand seizes her pretty pale throat. It's so pale. So, so pale. Only my mouth retains the freedom to move. I set my teeth to her chest. Ironic that he's the one doing the biting. <laughs> her body still resisting convulses under his touch. He sighs. His breath traces her stomach. The tickle of warm air is enough to make her squirm. He moves aside her clothing and brings his tongue to her sensitive, snow-white abdomen. Suddenly, he recalls a hunger. That's right. His stomach is empty. He's always been hungry. Saliva falls as he drools with a never sated appetite. The woman pushes against him, but she is no match for the hunger. What are you waiting for? It was the same before. Back then, you were the main dish, but this time, you get to dine. For all our differences, we are identical at our core. Her drinking your blood at the park, this stupid impulse, the burgers you had for lunch, it's all the same. We eat because we must. We eat because it's fun. We eat because we want to. We devour each other out of love. That's all this is. For us animals, that's all it needs to be. This resistance was inevitable. Her plump breasts jiggle below me. That trembling, mouth-watering canvas, the mark of a healthy woman. I sink my teeth into one of her breasts. God damn, dude. She raises her voice. Her back arches with surprise. I don't pay it any mind. I gnaw until I feel like I might rip through stopping short so I can run my tongue across and savor her taste. Her body heats up. I no longer feel a trace of the cold that hung so thick in the air. She struggles to muffle her cries, perhaps embarrassed by the sound. There's pity in her voice. My mind blurs. I've already abandoned all sanity and thought, but now it feels like my sense of self is getting more and more clouded. Her voice trembles with despair, but I don't hear it. I don't understand it. My knife rises higher, higher into the air. My vision is drowned by a bloody haze. The more conscious I grow of my urge to kill, the harder it becomes to stop myself from moving. A mournful voice. Her eyes are wet with tears. Shiki 
If only you knew. My head hurts. My instincts scream to keep going. My heart insists that if I stop now, I'm dead. That somewhere down the line, she'll gut me in my sleep. But she's crying. This woman who always smiles so brightly, so confidently, is crying. I can't believe it. I can't allow it. If it were me, I would never make you cry. Which is funny because that's what you're doing right now. My head hurts. It's screaming at me to run. The conflicting impulses mesh together. One last time, I ask myself what I want to do. I... Simply want her? I can't despise her. I mean... I mean... I mean, he does want her, but if I pick can't despise her, does that mean I won't kill her? Because if I go and want her, does that essentially mean I'm going to go through with my, uh, my uh, internal desires of wanting to kill her too? Oh my goodness. Can't despise her. I can't do it. I can't make her cry again. Last time my headache made me feel this way, I killed her. So no, not again. Even if it burns my brain to cinders, I won't defile our quid. I pull away from Arcwade. The headache dissipates and my heartbeat returns to normal. The clouds of violence clear from my mind, granting me a full realization of what I was doing. <laughs> I can hardly believe myself, but the memory is all too clear. I push Arcwade against the ground. I tighten my hand around her neck, and I was on the verge of running my knife through her body. And I'd sought out her flesh like a beast. What do I say to this? Arcwade readjusts her clothes as she gets back on her feet. How can I even start apologizing? Sorry isn't going to cut it. I did something deplorable. Evil. No, she's wrong. This was my fault. Who gives a shit about chronic anemia or never ending dizziness? Neither of them matter. None of this would have happened if I weren't so fucked up.式は私の魔眼を見てしまった。抑えることなんてできるはずがない。吸血鬼の目は魅了の魔眼だと言ったでしょ。見た人間の気持ちに関係なく、自分の虜にするのろい。だから気にしないで。式が私に性的欲求を
Just seeing her so repentant is making my heart ache. It didn't feel like I was being controlled. If anything, it felt like my true desires had been unleashed, like my mind was just following their lead. Arcade. I. あやまらないで。四季。これは事故よ。私も忘れるから、あなたも忘れて。そうした方がお互いのためになるわ。Arkway whispers these words before quietly walking away. Haru. Her name catches in my throat. And though I want to reach out my hand to stop her, it refuses to move. And like that, she disappears from the dark alleyway. The last thing I saw was her forced smile. Then she turned and leaped, like a rabbit on the moon. Nande. Even if I gave chase, I'd never catch up. It's not like I'd have a way to stop her even if I did. Self-hatred and remorse goge at my heart until there's nothing left. In the alley, the stage for this unspeakable tragedy, I gaze up at the white moon as if to repent. That was a hard chapter to read, guys. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. That blood red moon indeed. It's morning. I feel for my glasses and put them on before I open my eyes. The sky outside of the window is a beautiful, gentle blue. But no amount of sun could brighten my mood. The reason for my misery is obvious. I can't shake the image of her moonlit profile as she apologized to me. It'll be better for the both of us. What did she mean by that? Was she asking me to forget what I did to her in the alley? Or did she want me to forget all about her? Either way, that's not gonna happen. There's no way I could forget even a moment of our time together. I stared down at my hands. My fingers still recalled the feel of her body, the smoothness of her skin, the way she felt cool to the touch yet warm at the same time. Now all I've got are regrets. If she decided to kill me back then, I wouldn't have begrudged her one bit. But despite my guilt, a selfish thought veers its head. Why couldn't I have had more control over myself? When my fingers coursed across her body, I was little more than an animal. Had I possessed more of my senses, had I been more human, it could have been... <laughs> I bite back at my self-indulgent fantasies. Her gold eyes aren't what made me lose it. When was it that I started to feel this way? Without realizing it, without even knowing why, I've fallen for her. I've felt like this for so long now, maybe even from the moment she said she'd forgive me for the things I did to her. It was never about Roa to begin with. I've been crazy about Arcwade since day one, but now, It's probably for the best if we don't meet again. I can't stop thinking of how lonely her smile felt back then. It's too late. If I'd noticed sooner, I never would have made her feel that way. The morning plays out as usual. History comes to wake me up. I find Akia and Kohaku in the parlor. We exchange pleasantries before I head to school. 
the same mundane routine. This peace and quiet was what we put our lives on the line for. I should be happy. I didn't lose anything. Yet I feel empty, like a machine blankly following its pre-programmed commands. I perform my morning regimen before leaving for school. The students near the gate look cheerful. As I pick up bits of conversation here and there, I realize everyone's chatting about their weekend plans. So, I was so caught in a hurricane arc way that I completely lost track of what day it is. We first met on a Friday morning too. She was right here waiting for me by the crossing. From that very first day, she always had a smile on her face. Even as she was laying in ambush for her murderer, not once did she lose that mischievous glint in her eyes. But the chance to ask her has come and gone. There's no way I'll find her waiting for me in the park again. I take my seat. There's five more minutes until homeroom. With nothing else to do, I idly look over the schoolyard from the window. Speaking of suspiciously absent, where the hell is Satsuki? <laughs> hint, hint. I hear a long drawn out sigh. Normally, I'd exchange bars with him, but I just don't have the energy for it today. Arihiko slumps his shoulders in an exaggerated motion. I sentence stopped short. Who? Who was I talking about again? Neither of us know any of the third years. Forgetting CL? Arihiko slips out of the classroom's back door. Just as he leaves, the door at the front opens to let Miss Noel, or not, it turns out to be the homeroom teacher of the class next door. The laid back math teacher explains the situation in an apathetic tone. A little soon if you ask me. What is that? It's not a Wales of despair are up from Miss Noel's dedicated male fan club. It finally clicks in my head. In this place so far removed from everything, something as trivial as a teacher quitting forces me to face reality. It's really over. Miss Noel was only ever our substitute teacher to observe me, or rather, the person she believed to be the vampire Roa. If she's gone, it means her work here is done. I'm now completely free from the whole vampire ordeal. Not a single thread connects me to it any longer. Classes end for the day. 
With tomorrow being Saturday, the students scurry off like an army of arachnids the second the final bell rings. I fulfilled all my scholarly obligations for today. The rest of the day is time I can dedicate to myself. So I'll. I'll just. What should I be doing? I'm like a kite cut loose from its string. Gone is my obligation to protect this place. Gone is our mission to rid the city of vampires. I'm bereft of the one driving force that guided me for the past week. Who cares anymore? I might as well take a nap here. It'd be a perfectly sensible thing for an ordinary person to do. She's gone. Miss Noelle's gone too. Maybe. I got myself in too deep with this vampire business. The executor said that for humans, there's no such thing as a good vampire. Can I really still believe she's good after seeing her like that? It'd be smart to go home while you still can. This might be your last chance to pretend you were never involved in any of this. The blonde-headed kid's warning resonates in my mind. Yeah, Shiki, look on the bright side. You can finally say goodbye to the vampire crap and go back to living a normal life. I'll pretend that none of this has ever happened. Look upon reality in the end. I'm pretty sure if I pick the first option, we're going to get like a, not even a bad end, maybe a bad end, but I, I think it's going to be a standard end. Ah, let's go in a new file. We're here to face reality and not run away from it. I can't see her again. How could I after what I did? But even so, I'm determined to fulfill my promise to her one last time. If I have the chance to come face to face with the things I couldn't do, I have to take it. And perhaps once I do that, I'll be able to put these emotions to rest. I stand in front of the disaster's ruins. Six days have passed since the fire. The area is now completely silent. The ruins are a little more than a cruel reminder of the tragedy that took place. Not a trace of remains of the once popular park in front of the station. This place used to be so full of life. Full of people unknown to me with whom I've never crossed paths. I never knew them, yet I just can't let it go. Yet I can just let go as I never knew them. It would be easy enough to absolve myself of any guilt, especially when I had no hand in this. If ignorance is a sin, then all humans are sinners. If insincerity is evil, then all of humanity is damned. So why should I hang my head here? I can't let myself lament the deaths of strangers. Mourning the dead out of my own arbitrary feelings of sadness is just wrong. Instead, farewells ought to be used to reflect on our time with them. The tears we shed should honor their memory as well as their deeds. Tears or apologies born out of sorrow are nothing more than rituals we perform for our own selfish ends. That should mean I can just turn back and put this all behind me. Or so I thought. Despite everything, I can't seem to pull myself away. I shouldn't feel this sadness. I shouldn't feel this self-righteousness. At the end of the day, I should just be looking out for myself. And yet, I keep coming to the same conclusion. You can't just call it quits after you've lost it all. Once you've done everything you can, you should let the curtain fall with your head held high. It feels like a stranger taught me that once upon a time. Footsteps echo behind me. I look over to see her. A girl wearing our school uniform, though I don't recognize her face. But I do. And while I feel like I should know her, 
I can't even recall her name. It's Yell. Konnichiwa. Anata mo kenka ni kitan desu ka? Oh, you know what I was here for. Iya. Ore wa. Her eyes are locked in the area in front of the barricade. The place is covered in bouquets. They rustle in unison, as if in remembrance of the dearly departed. I was here to determine myself. I was able to answer half of it. But I was... There's no way I can turn my back to these vampires. I can't forget about Roa. And I definitely can't forget about her. Yeah, so it was. You were a bad person, you. She never once looks at me. Nor do I look at her. It seems the polite thing to do for someone who came all this way to offer a warning to a stranger. Roa is a bad person. She is a bad person. Do you understand the meaning of that? I understand. I can't do anything on this path. I understand. I thought you didn't remember her. Or is she allowing you to remember? If you kill her, you will only be killed. I don't want to kill her. I don't want to kill her. I don't want to kill her. それはどうして一度でも吸血衝動に負けた真相はもう手遅れだからです血を吸いたいという欲求は真相にだってあるいえそもそも人間の血を吸いたいという欲求は真相から人間に移されたもの死とは所詮人間の慣れの果てに過ぎない私たち人間にとって正真正銘の怪物は真相と呼ばれる始まりの吸血鬼彼女にとってあなたは協力者である前に血液に過ぎません But you're wrong. 始まりってそれはどういう考えたことがないとは言わせません血を吸われたことで人間が吸血鬼化するのならその根源大元にあたる初めから吸血鬼だった存在がいることをこの生命としての系統樹が異なる吸血種を神祖と言います人間の血なんて必要なく人たちと同等いえそれ以上の超越能力を持つ者たち彼女はその神祖と呼ばれる一族の王族なんです彼らには身分階級がありませんから王族というのは正しくはありませんけどあまりにも気持ちを受けたことは私は彼女が言うことは全てのことは私は彼女が言うことは私は彼女が言うことは私は彼女が言うことは私は彼Damn. But even a children's book would include a princess this stupidly cheerful and reckless. いいですか。神祖と呼ばれる吸血種には、使徒たちよりはるかに業の深い吸血衝動がある。神祖たちはもともと人間の血がなくても生存できる。けれど、その誕生にどんな間違いが起こったのか、彼らは唯一の欠点。不要な機能を持ってしまったそれが吸血衝動ただ人間の血が欲しいという思考性です過去神祖に襲われればこれに対抗できる人間はいなかったそして血を吸われた人間はその時点で人間で亡くなってしまう原因は生命体としてのスケールの違いとも彼らが血液を魂として捉えているとも言われていますそ
神祖という強大な生命に血を奪われた時点で人間は人間ではいられなくなるその神祖の分身平たく言えば人形になってしまう仮に血を吸う側の神祖がそれを望まなくと思い出した使徒は自分の血を送ることで人間を仲間にするんだっけ逆に神祖ってやつはただ血を吸うだけで人間を犯すってことですかええそして問題は彼らの吸血衝動には理由がないということです理由がないから止めようがない神祖という完璧な生命が内包した欠点死に至る病とでも言えましょうか彼らは血を吸いたいという衝動を抑えて生きていますそれは理性で我慢をするといったレベルの話ではありません具体的物理的に彼らは持てる全ての力を使って常に自分自身の欲求を封印している強大な異能を自身に使うことで彼らは吸血衝動を抑えているけれどもし何らかの外的要因でその心祖の能力が低下してしまった場合抑えていた吸血衝動がどうなるかわかりますか What happens if an external force causes their powers to diminish? Say someone inflicted a heavy wound and they had to expend a great deal of their power to recover. What if they were killed to such a degree that reviving took nearly all the energy they had? Let's assume Arkwit has 10 units of energy. Now let's say she was using 7 of those 10 units to hold back her urges at all times. If she were to then lose 5 of them, That would leave her with just five units to hold back seven units worth of desire. That's not enough. What would she take in to make for, for that deficit? So, the shadow to yara o s a i r a r e n a k u n a t a s h i n s o d o n a r u n d e s k a Motiron hito no chio suimas. Sono ato ni wa nani mo a r i m a s e Could you please be more specific? Itchdoshodonimakatashinsoa.Atoahochteikudakedes.Itchdochinoajoshitashinsoa.Sonoshodonioruitamimobaikasurtokimas.Kekatoshte.Mo n I think of how Arkwe looked back then. Her bloodshot eyes, her wild and ragged panting. The way her breath burned against my neck. Demo. It has to be a lie. She told me herself she's terrified of drinking blood. 